So we read today from Thessalonians, uh, the first letter of St. Paul in the fifth chapter. There's more verses listed in the bulletin, but we're going to make it real simple. This is a holiday week, and I know you all need something easier. So just, so, so just three verses, okay? Beginning in verse 16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Well, these are perhaps the three shortest verses in a row in all of the Bible. Each one only has two or three words in the original language. Pantote carete, always rejoice. Adialiptos prosusiete, unceasingly pray. In pante eucharistete, in everything give thanks. Now, when the Bible was written, of course, there were, there were no chapters or verses. Uh, those were done afterwards for convenience, we may say. A Greek manuscript from around 325 A.D., Vaticanus Codex, uh, was the first to even divide paragraphs in the Bible. And it took 200 more years after that before the fabled Bible translator Jerome, working away in Bethlehem, clumped together short passages called, it's a pericopes. But it wasn't until 1227 A.D. that an Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, also a hero of the Magna Carta, put the modern chapter divisions into place. Imagine that. Not until 1227. And it took, five, and it took about, uh, about uh, until 1500 something, three years later, when a French printer, Robert Estienne, finally devised a standard system of numbering the verses, one that's been used in almost every Bible version since. He gave an address to every single scripture, if you would. That leads to the question of, well, how do you decide? How do you determine how to, how to break up things? Because after all, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, there weren't even spaces between words. The papyrus was too valuable to waste that. You didn't even know if one word went to the last sentence or the next sentence. You weren't sure if one letter was the last letter in one word or the first letter in the next word. You got to say, how do you decide then how to make verses? And why would you have given these three simple commands, two words each, each of them a separate verse. Uh, Esther 8, verse 9, for example, has 80 to 90 words, depending on how you translate it. Revelation 20, verse 4, has 75 words in that verse. I would suggest, though, that perhaps the French versifier of Holy Scriptures was on to something when he chose to divvy up these particular words of St. Paul to those in one of his churches in just this way. Because when it comes down to it, this really is the essence of the Christian faith, isn't it? Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Sort of like that cheesy Julia Roberts movie and which of them are not um, of 10 years ago. Eat, pray, love, <laughs> without having to go all the way to Italy and India and, and Bali. And so as we come to another Thanksgiving this week, th these three little verses would seem to be a more than just passing relevance to us. Because first of all, St. Paul tells his readers that they should rejoice always. And the word for rejoice, Cairo, is one that quite literally has grace written all over it. It comes from the same root word as, as, as charis, as in charismatic, which means to delight in God's grace, to experience it in all of his fullness, and in turn, to be glad for it. We find this word first used in the Gospels in Matthew 2.10, where we read that, that, that as the wise men saw the star that had stopped over the place where the Christ child was born, that they were, they were overjoyed. Literally, they rejoiced with great joy exceedingly. And you hear it again in the Sermon on the Mount, 
And Jesus told his followers to rejoice and be glad, even when they were being persecuted, because great was their reward in, in heaven. In short, joy doesn't come from Macy's or, or from Costco. It, it comes from Jesus. It's the product not of having great possessions. It's the product of having God's grace in our lives. That's why we should rejoice always, even when our personal circumstances don't seem to merit it otherwise. See, the people to whom Paul was writing, those who lived in the capital city of Macedonia, Thessalonica, Salonica, Greece now. They, they knew something about suffering because of their faith. Go back to the book of Acts, chapter 17. You will find how it was Paul who brought the gospel to them after he and Silas had been imprisoned in Philippi. And then joined by Timothy, they had all been thrown out of that town. So they simply went on down the famous Roman road, the Via Ednatia, to Thessalonica, where, as was their custom, they went first to the Jewish synagogue in that Greco Roman city. And on three successive Sabbath days, Paul reasoned with those who were there from the scriptures with some success. Not only were several Jews converted, persuaded. A large number of non-Jews were converted too. Those were the Greek pagans known as God-fearers. Those were individuals who came to the synagogue even though they weren't Jewish because they were looking for something to hang on to in life. Something better than the pagan uh, Roman and Greek gods whose temples littered the hills. And apparently after hearing Paul, they found what they'd been searching for. Now, unfortunately, that just made some of the other uh, Jews in the synagogue jealous. And so like, a, like an angry crowd outside of a courthouse, maybe, they began to, to drag people before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world, older versions read, those that have turned the world upside down have now come here. When is the last time anyone has ever accused us of doing that, by the way? Of turning the world upside down, of causing trouble, good trouble, causing trouble because of Jesus. They raised such a ruckus that Paul and his companions had to leave that town too. But those who had heard the message continued to believe despite the opposition to them. They became imitators of Paul and of Paul's Lord. So chapter 1, verse 6 of this book tells us they welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given them by the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul could say what he did to them thus. Exhorting them to rejoice evermore because, again, to really rejoice is simply to lean into God's grace and to delight in his favor. You ever done that? Delight in the favor of God? One commentator has even suggested that the Christian who wallows in sadness is really kind of breaking the commandment of sorts because in some direction or other, he or she is mistrusting God, mistrusting his power, mistrusting his providence, mistrusting his forgiveness. Yeah, rejoice always. The next little verse takes us even further because Paul said that we should pray unceasingly. And the word that translates pray, uh, is likewise a very rich word that is compounded from, a, from, the, from the preposition for to or toward, pro, uh, and another verb, utomai, that means to wish or desire for something. So to pray is thus to exchange wishes with the Lord, if you will. It is to interact with him by switching our wishes, our ideas, for his wishes, his plans for us. Another way to put this is, is that to pray is to check signals with the Savior to make sure we are following his plan, not just our own. Which is why we're told to do this without ceasing. Now that sounds kind of impossible, doesn't it? 
I mean, who, who, can, who can be praying all the time? Well, the answer is we can. If we understand prayer to be an ongoing, continual conversation with God as open-ended as life itself may be. We see this dramatically demonstrated, I, I, I think, in an old musical, one of my very favorites, Fiddler on the Roof. Most of you have seen it, I think. The Russian peasant milkman, Tevya, has a running dialogue with God all throughout the story, whether he's milking his cows or he's talking with a rabbi or he's worrying about his daughters. Have a listen to, to one of those interchanges. Was that necessary? <laughs> Did you have to make him lame just before the Sabbath? <sighs> that wasn't nice. It's enough you pick on me. Bless me with five daughters, a life of poverty. That's all right. But what have you got against my horse? Really, sometimes I think when things are too quiet up there, you say to yourself, let's see, what kind of mischief can I play on my friend Tevye? Aha! Uh -huh. So you're finally here, my breadwinner. I'll talk to you later. Now that's not quite the model prayer of the New Testament, is it? But it's an honest one. That's what God wants from us. Because when we're honest, we can talk to God about everything. Just as we would a friend or a spouse. Pray without ceasing, Paul says. And then so verse 18 goes on to tell us, give thanks in all circumstances. And wouldn't you know it, that same term for grace that we mentioned earlier, charis, shows up in this word as well. The Greek text here reads in Ponte, in the whole, in all things, eucharistio. It's another compound word. This one adding the word for good, E-U, to charis. So quite, so quite, actually it is, be thankful for God's good grace. What a great idea that is. We get our English term for the Lord's Supper, the one sacramentalist and high church folks like to use, the Eucharist from this word. We read it in Corinthians that at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and when he'd given thanks, that's the verb, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Eucharistio. That's why our youngest grandchild, whom we will see this week, even has that word in her name. Madeline Evangeline, because she was born on Easter Sunday. Madeline is, is another form of the word Madeline, as in Mary Magdalene, who was the first to see Jesus. Evangeline refers to the evangel, the gospel that was proclaimed. So Madeline Evangeline, but then as is the custom for some people in England, she has a second middle name, Eucharistia. Madeline Evangeline Eucharistia Harvey. It doesn't fit on any of those little boxes. You know, you got to put them all in there. It's hard to spell. But I'm telling you, that girl has grace running all the way through her. Just like her older brother and sister, Jedediah and Talitha, and her Katie cousins, Bryson and Sophie. And Cademan, Cademan's up on the balcony this morning. All of them with the grace of God. Give thanks because Paul goes on to say, this is God's will for you. More properly, this is his preferred will. We can even say, this is his best offer to people like you and to me. It's a word almost always used exclusively of God. 
But again, it brings us back to exchanging our wishes for his, our desires for his, even our dreams for his plans for us. But you know, he knows the plans he has for us, right? Jeremiah 29, plans to prosper and to bless us, not to harm us, to give us future and to hope. What's more, just like Paul's admonition to rejoice always is repeated later on in his letter to the other Macedonian church, Philippi. So to this word here in 518 is not a one-off for us in the verse either. We read the same command in Ephesians 520, which tells us we should always be giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we should be giving thanks even when we're not sure what we're giving thanks for. See, it's not what we're thankful for that's as important as remembering the one to whom we are thankful. There was an English writer of an earlier time who was known to be a, an atheist. She was once walking with a friend one autumn day, taking in the glorious fall colors that were splashed all around her, and suddenly she exclaimed, Oh, I'm so thankful. To which her friend turned to her and quietly said, Thankful to whom, my dear? True thankfulness. It's about recognizing God's grace that indeed surrounds us like an autumn day. Matthew Henry, the famed Bible commentator, was once robbed, but later on he told his family he was thankful. And they asked him what he was thankful for. He said simply, I'm thankful because I was never robbed before. Because although they took my wallet, they didn't take my life. Because although they took my all, it wasn't very much. And I'm thankful that I was the one who was robbed and not the one who did the robbing. That should be the case for us too, shouldn't it, this morning? You see, there's always something to be thankful for. You should be thankful that if you can't pay your bills, for example, that you're not one of your creditors. <laughs> you can be thankful that only God and you know the real you. <laughs> you can be thankful for doors of opportunity and the friends who oiled, hin who oiled those, those hinges. You can be thankful that your teenagers will one day have children of their own who will grow up to become teenagers. I know Thanksgiving can be a difficult time for some folks. Johnny Carson once said, it's an emotional holiday. People travel thousands of miles to be with people that they only see once a year. And then some of them discover that once a year is way too much. <laughs> but Thanksgiving is challenging in other ways. Travel itself isn't easy these days. We're excited because tomorrow morning, Julie and I are going to, to England for the first time in, in two and a half years. We're going to see our kids and our grandchildren there. But traveling's not easy. Some of you have just figured that out. We've had to fill out more forms, upload more documents, go through more hoops. Uh, the, the British government wants to know exactly where we'll be on day two so that we can take a COVID test, even though we're already vaccinated. And they'll check on us. Um, and just getting through all of that has been kind of this, this hurdle. Uh, packing has been a hurdle because uh, when we go to England, we, we're basically pack rats. We're, we're just mules taking stuff. We have two big suitcases, two big, two big bags, and I think we have this much space for our, for, for our clothing for, for 10 days. We're full of things that they won't and they can't get there. We're taking tea to England. <laughs> what is wrong with that? Travel's not easy. Inflation has made everything cost more. The supply chain crisis has seen items that we won't simply fly off the shelves, even if turkeys can't fly. And family dynamics, it can be difficult sometimes. Some families just don't know how to put the fun into dysfunctional, do they? <laughs> but more significantly, 
It's a time in which the losses of our lives can seem so crippling to us as we see an empty chair around that dinner table. But as another Thanksgiving holiday comes this week, perhaps these are words that we should remember as well. Three short and simple verses to tell us exactly what we as believers in Christ should be about in this season. Rejoice always. Though often persecuted, the New Testament church was permeated with a sense of holy joy, and ours should be as well. Especially in this time of general unrest and anger on the part of so many. Everybody's angry today. We can't be. We have to have joy. We live in an unhappy age, which makes it all the more important that we who believe in God act like that belief makes life not just bearable, makes life good. Pray unceasingly, not just about the big things in life, all the small ones as well. I like that good Father, God wants to know all that we're doing and thinking and feeling. So open up those channels of conversation. And give thanks in all things. If not exactly for the things that cause us woe, but for God who may have brought us to this day to show his power. To quote Matthew Henry once more, we should give thanks for sparing and preventing, for common and uncommon, past and present, temporal and spiritual mercies, not only for prosperous and pleasing, but also for afflicting providences for chastisements and corrections. For God designs all for our good, though we at present see not how they tend to it. All of these really are God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Some years back, I, I came across an anonymous poem that sums this all up. It's entitled simply, I Thank Thee. It goes like this, O thou whose bounty fills my cup with every blessing meet, I give thee thanks for every drop, the bitter and the sweet. I praise thee for the desert road and for the riverside, for all thy goodness hath bestowed and all thy grace denied. Then it ends this way, I bless thee for the glad increase and for the waning joy and for this strange, this subtle peace which nothing can destroy. My thanksgiving prayer for each of you is that you may know that strange, subtle peace in your lives this morning as well. No matter what's happened in times past. You say, what do I have to be thankful for? If nothing else, you can at least be thankful that you are not a turkey this week. So it might be best to try your best not to act like one. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.